have faculty from Spain, Denmark, USA, and our own experts. I will give a brief introduction about them. The today's facilitator is Professor Ignacio Sanpera. He is from University Hospital, Barcelona, Spain. The growth modulation and the pathology of growth plate are his keen area of interest. He has a lot of publications on this topic. So he's going to present cases related to the points which we are going to discuss. With us, we have a Bernie Moller Medicine. He's from University Hospital, Aarhus, Denmark. And he's the head of Dennis Pediatric Orthopedic Research Group. He's also a past president of European Pediatric Orthopedic Society. The third faculty is the one who is the innovator of eight plate. And he has been to India two times. And he is very well known for various aspects of uh, eight plate. At present, he practices in Salt Lake City. And in addition to the private practice, he has also participated in many um, voluntary activity to the third world countries, which is called the Mercy Ship Organization. We are really fortunate to have Dr. Taral Nagna with us. I must appreciate that before four weeks, he met with a serious accident, but he, his commitment to the webinar was such that he said that I will be in the webinar and today he's going to present one excellent case. Taral is affiliated to Saifi Hospital, Jupiter Hospital of uh, Mumbai, which are very famous centers for pediatric orthopedic. And in addition to that, he's a webmaster of POSI. The fifth faculty is Manoj Padman. He is director of Center of Pediatric Orthopedic and Disability in Delhi. He is attached to Rainbow Children Hospital, Fortis Institute, and Manipal Hospital in Delhi. A brief idea about the format of the webinar. As I said earlier, Professor Senpera will present a case and will give us a background about the controversy which we are going to discuss. And then we will have a panel discussion. I'm sure that our panel is really eminent speakers and they are going to put forward different views and we are going to learn from the controversial discussion. If you have any question, you can WhatsApp your questions to Sandeep on the mobile number 982306398. I repeat, 9823063989. Before I hand over to our moderator, just a few words about the next webinar. The next webinar is on 8th April, and this time we have kept a topic which is very important and rarely discussed, that's management of open fractures in children. We have two experts from Europe, Fergal Manson from UK and Arnold Bezler from Netherlands. They are going to be our faculty. And in addition to that, we will also have our Indian experts. So with that, I hand over to Professor Senpera for the today's discussion. Thank you. Over to you, Professor. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> I want first uh, of all uh, to thank Posse and Professor Gandalab for uh, inviting us again to be uh, in Posse. It's for us a pleasure, and I'm sure I'm talking for the whole panelists. And I'm also honored to share uh, this opportunity with such eminent people that I'm sure will help me to enlighten me a bit more about controversies in growth modulation. Okay, I'm just going to start with our first case. That's a child age uh, four that was involved in a motor vehicle accident. He <clears throat> sustained a Salter Harris two fracture of the distal fibula and tibia that was treated initially with blaster. And <clears throat> subsequently they discovered that he had a fibula arrest. He was seen in another hospital and treated with uh, a hemiepiphysiodesis of the medial malleolus using a uh, screw through the medial malleolus or, or hemiepiphysiodesis of the tibia. 
And he arrived to us at the age of six and three months. Uh, what uh, we did is we follow him, but it looked like his uh, nail was, uh, his screw was cutting through the cortex. So we decided to change to an eight plate. So probably it's not the ideal case for an eight plate, but I want to hear the opinion of the panel about uh, this treatment and what it can happen with that. I pass the turn to Manoch, please, if you want to give your opinion. So, uh, yeah, so here we have a situation wherein the fibula station is quite high. It's well above the, uh, well above the uh, normal level. It's well above the tibial growth plate. Um, so I'm not sure. I mean, I have dealt with a few instances of uh, where the fibula arrest has happened post uh, fibula resections or post vascularized graft. Um, I do not know whether just a uh, medial eight plate alone would correct this. Um, the fibula would still be uh, higher. This would correct the angular deformity, but I'm not sure it would it would produce it would uh, achieve the necessary lateral buttress and bring the fibula down. Uh, I think you will need to kind of address that. Just pure uh, uh, hemiepiphysitis, I'm not convinced that this would do the job here. So I'll, ma <clears throat> I'll make a comment as well. Um, the child has eight, six more years of growth, and uh, it, it, this is one where you might consider a fibular lengthening at some point. But to temporize, yeah. I agree with the eight plate for the time being, but a technical point is that I would have put a longer screw, you aim right for the apex, put the longer screw you can. So I'd move the plate down, maybe even use a tall, taller plate and put that screw in first and then put on the plate and put in the other screw. And uh, I would submit that in children with short fibulas from other etiologies like um, hereditary multiple exostoses, it really doesn't matter what the fibula does in children as opposed to adults. So if you don't wanna lengthen the fibula, get a better grip with your eight plate that will correct the tibia and he'll have, you know, an eternally short fibula, but no symptoms. No, I like the Peter, the question is like what Manu said, like when there is a growth arrest of fibula, uh, by doing a medial epiphysiodesis, are we going to correct the problem? Because still yes. the little part of the distal tibia it can grow and can lead yes. to limb length discrepancy. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, the difference in the length of tibia and fibula. Well, you can, you can correct. <clears throat> I've had case different etiology. Again, hereditary multiple exostosis being the most common. You can correct both the valgus deformity, slightly overcorrect on purpose, and the diastasis, well, not the diastasis, but the medial widening will decrease. And you can ignore the fibula altogether as one choice. Um, you, I haven't had, I don't know if Dr. De, Julio de Pablos has done a physeal distraction in the fibula. There's not much territory to do that. But, um, you know, I would focus on the tibia and the horizontal plafond and, and not necessarily worry as much about the fibula unless you're inclined to later do a fibular lengthening. What about uh, uterus? Pardon me? Yeah. Yeah, so one, uh, one of the technical difficulties I've found while uh, doing eight plate for distal tibia is the height of the distal uh, tibial epiphyse. In younger children, it's very small, and you really need to have a very small screw and accurate placement so that you don't uh, damage the articular surface or the physis. Uh, so, the, so in, uh, when I'm doing epiphysotesis, semi epiphysotesis for lower tibia, I mark the epiphyseal screw first, then place my plate, and then put the metaphyseal. Just, just a technical. Yes. Do you think that this is going to solve the problem completely? Yes, Bernie, what do you think about like uh, this option? Well, looking, at, looking into that, I think it's, uh, as you always have said, I would focus on the tibia. And uh, as I see, it's nine years plus now. So if there come symptoms of still the valgusation of the foot, I will do a lengthening of the fibula. The fibula is a very kind bone in relation to 
elongations. So, so as I see it now, the growth has stopped in the fibula, and I will go further with the eight plates and be sure that the ankle mortis is horizontal. And then if there's any problem left, I will do a lengthening of the, of the fibula. And there's so many, we have so many options in relation to that. So I think that would be the option for me in this, in this child, for sure. Okay, yes, over to you, uh, Ignacio. Okay, so we carried on with the eight plates and what it happens is when uh, <coughs> we uh, were thinking about doing the lengthening, the patient arrived one day for his control. He said that had the sensation that uh, uh, something went on, that it was a bit more protruding the plate and we did an X-ray. Now it's two years down the line and you can see the X-ray on your run hand side with a broken screw on the epiphyseal area. Any comments? Uh, I, I just want to. I mean, this is this is an acquired fibular arrest. Uh, do these? My question to the panelists again is: Do they behave differently from a lot of the congenital conditions? Because the reason I ask that is, in, when, when we've seen a few cases of vascularized fibular harvest and the periosteum is removed and the fibula stops growing. And it's a well-known uh, entity there, the distal valgus there, along with proximal fibular migration, wherein you have to bring the fibula down, just stopping the growth arrest doesn't seem to solve the problem. Not only do you have to bring it down, you al almost have to create a synostosis between the fibula and the tibia to make sure that the relationship is maintained. That's, that's uh, my view on acquired, uh, these kind of acquired uh, scenarios. Any comments about the reasons for failure of the eight plates? Well, the plate didn't fail, the screw did. And uh, sorry, uh, sorry. If, if no. the short screw drags out a little bit, then the fulcrum, uh, the force is on the threaded portion of the screw. So it doesn't break where the head meets the shank, it breaks in the shank. So in this situation, being a, a zealot, I would take this plate out, put a long transverse screw distally and another eight plate and I would, I would consider fibular lengthening. I, you know, I only mentioned HME as one etiology, but in spina bifida and other conditions, as opposed to adults, you can ignore the fibula. So this is a traumatic cause, but it's kind of a, almost a congenital equivalent that if you've got a horizontal profond through guided growth, the fibula won't matter. And the medial clear space is a little bit improved even though the valgus isn't totally corrected. One question I have. Yeah, Tarul, please. Yeah. yeah. Is the is the you know capacity of lower tibia spices to grow? Uh, you know, it's it said that less than nine years, it's the fast growing spices. After nine years, it becomes very lazy, and then you have uh, very early closure of the distal tibial spice. So at eleven plus. 10 years, uh, you know, is there much growth left in these spices to use a growth modulation? That's my question. I think there's enough growth left. Also, I don't think the distal fibular physis is closed. I can still see it. So I don't know what to make of that. And the second question is like, uh, uh, this is basically a cannulated screw. Instead of that, if we use a solid screw, uh, something like a cortical screw, will it reduce the possibility of uh, breakage of the implant? Yeah, it, it, it's the surgeon's choice. It makes you feel better. The, the solid screw is probably 50, 60% stronger to bending stress, but even solid screws will break if the shank is exposed. If the screw, if, the, if it's not well countersunk, a solid four or five screw can break too. So, you know, I'm, <clears throat> I don't think cannulation is, I think the short, the short purchase in retrospect was part of the problem. This may not have dragged upward and broken had we had a longer screw at the outset. Okay, so let's have the opinion like, uh, Barney, what will you do now? Yeah, well, I agree with you that I would, um, I would change the screws to be longer, especially the, the one in the epiphysis. And I think it's still useful to have it but there might be a place for it. So I will have a double length of the screws and uh, 
then I would really consider now 11 years and 10 months to lengthen the fibula. I think it's time now, of course, I can see there is, there is a need for that cause, and maybe there's a pain. I don't know if the child have pain now, but, but it's hard to look upon it now to see the fibula going shorter and shorter. So I would put in longer screws with the same, maybe another plate, but still an eight plate, and then I'll start the elongation of the, of the fibula. Okay, yes, Manoj, what will you do now? Um, I, I, I definitely, the fibula needs addressing, in my opinion. Um, whether you, to kind of reduce the quantum of lengthening and you want to kind of control some of the angulation, yes, the medial, um, uh, the eight plate, the technical issues, what uh, Pete Stevens alluded to, can be uh, you know, considered as well. But the fibula, I think, definitely needs to be brought down as well. It's almost 12. Um, that's, that's really high. You know, I'm not comfortable with such a high riding fibula. Right. Taral, what will I'm you do curious. for the fibula in addition to that? Okay, in addition to the change of the eight plate? So if, this the... Was, uh, if this was an Indian patient, 11 plus 10 years, they, they close the lower tibia physis very fast. And I, I feel growth modulation will not work in an Indian uh, boy at this stage. So my, my choice would be to do a dome osteotomy of the lower tibia and uh, do lengthening of the fibula at the same time uh, to get the mortis uh, horizontal. Sandeep, what do you think about to... this for the Indian? Yeah. I, I agree with Taral. I have had bad experiences with trying to do this, especially with paralytic valgoid feet in post meningomyelitis or uh, uh, post uh, sick physis like this because a uh, couple of things one these children are in braces and the medial eight plate really impinges on the brace and they start getting pain bursa and ulcers so I think it's not a really uh, friendly implant in paralytic conditions in addition because of the neurology the growth is so slow that the correction really doesn't happen at best, it may prevent progression, but I haven't seen it get corrected. Okay. So, uh, and what about the fibula? What will you do to the fibula? I, my Tarat's plan is what I would do, a dome osteotomy with uh, bringing the fibula down, turn it around, get the mortise horizontal and put screws across trans epiphysis. Means my cut will be through the physis. I do a permanent epiphyseal disease for the tibia. Okay, and so then you don't need... And lengthen later. Right. And then you, you don't need any eight plate for that because nothing, you are going through nothing. the physis. No, no. Okay. I'll do a TBW with a very low cut through the physis. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, Ignacio, now we can, uh, we are really interested in what uh, you did. Well, what happened to I, this I, patient. I, 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 I did not show the, the I didn't bring the x rays with, because I wanted to discuss broken screws. But what we did, was an open osteotomy, just uh, uh, <clears throat> lengthening the fibula and uh, trying to <laughs> store length. I think uh, that's, uh, we accepted that uh, it's going to be, it's 11, it's a girl, it's nearly 12. So it's nearly about end of growth, despite that the physis look quite reasonable, but we accepted that we were going to lengthen by doing an opening uh, wedge osteotomy. And the second thing, it's, I think the eight plate did a great job. I mean, this girl had a, a, a closer of the fibula at the age of four, and it has hole up up to the age of 12, thanks to the eight plate. So I would think in, in my understanding, uh, it really worked very well despite that mm, we had some failure, but uh, I think it was expected. The reason why we decided not to replace the eight plate, it's the patient had pain. Okay, she was complaining that she, when she was walking for a long time, uh, she, had, uh, she was complaining of pain about the ankle, and we decided that we had to level the ankle. So what we did was a lengthening of the fibula, and then an open osteotomy just to, uh, balance the, the thing, the tibial plateau. So, okay, so yeah, what so I wanted is... to discuss is why it happens the failure and how often the failure of the screws happen. 
So what I did is I did a review of the literature and we, it's a paper by Booger. He re related that around 50% of surgeons in a, um, mm, sorry, in a questionnaire that's passed to the POSNA member related that they had mechanical failure, always was related to cannulated screws. In two cases were epiphyseal screws, but most of the cases were metaphyseal failures at the shunt because of three-point bending. Most patients were obese, but 73% of the patients were obese or morbid obese. And it was raised the question whether blunt could be related to the instability of the physis. Also, the group of Peter Stevens addressed the, the factor of failure, especially in Blount's disease. And they couldn't find any correlation between uh, body mass index and hardware failure. And they hypothesized that when the screws are widely divergent, they may impinge on the plate and fail prematurely, or it may be related to the lack of predealing of the holes. And also the fact that you leave a gap between the plate and the cortex. There is also a study where, uh, from the um, special surgery in New York where they compared three types of screws. And they looked for the incidence of broken screws and pull out. And they found that they had an incidence of 6.1%. And they consider pull out when the screw back more than five millimeters. All the patients that uh, had a, a pull out or a broken screw had cannulated the screws and were overweight. And they couldn't find any relationship with age, type of plate or the initial magnitude. And that's all what I could find about failure of the implants that it's still, despite how widely it's used, it's still quite a rarity. So I have a couple of a couple yeah, of please. Comments. Is that okay? Uh, yeah, I think the biggest factor is is when you're applying the plate, be sure you have good contact, especially in both screws, especially in the type of seal. The, the plates have a ten degree convex bend, and if that's not sufficient you can bend it a little more so you have better, better fit. Second thing, I don't think BMI has any factor. It's always often surmised, usually in the bounce articles, that BMI is a factor. But if you could put a strain gauge on the plate, you're putting the plate on an intact bone. And so it doesn't matter what the BMI is. I get many kids who are over 150 kilograms, one was 185 kilograms, who don't break screws. So I don't think BMI per se is the issue. But of the fat kids, Many are probably vitamin D deficient. And I do think that Blount's is a slipped upper tibial epiphysis, that there's a torsional instability in addition to the angular force. And that's why those kids tend to break the metaphyseal screw. It, it's the, yes, the weight plays a role in those kids, but it's the instability of the upper tibial physis in that diagnosis that is a greater risk. So com comparing that to all those who don't have broken screws, yes, um, if you have a broken screw and you feel better to put in a solid screw, which I occasionally do, that's fine, but you still need to countersink it and make sure the plate has good contact. Um, and for screw pullout, I tend to use the longest screw that will fit. It's not critical to go past the midline of the bone per se, but even in small kids, I'll put a screw as far across as I can, thinking that it won't drag as much and therefore won't migrate or pull out. And that's often helpful. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, please, please, Bernie. Yeah. Yeah. This was exactly my question because uh, this is my experience that short screws have a greater sequence of, of breaking and longer screws is better. So, so I have, as you mentioned, Peter, I don't, I don't have any evidence for that, but I'm looking very much that uh, on this issue that my screws are long enough. So. So maybe that could be a good uh, that that could go could be a good thing to 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 tell colleagues that please use long screws. Could that be 
I mean, could that be the, the final thing to put on this? Uh, I mean, very good presentation to say that go as far as you can with the screws or is there any, do you think there's any, I mean, do we do mistakes if you pass the middle of the bone? Is there anything about that? Is there any evidence for that? May I do a comment? We, we did a research work where we compared different length of screws on a, in an experimental model in rabbits. Uh, we couldn't, we compare screws that were five versus nine millimeters. Uh, so it was a sensible difference between both groups. And uh, what we saw was no difference. In fact, the shorter screw was a bit more effective on doing angulation, but was marginal. But we didn't see any failure of the uh, shorter screws or breakage or pullouts of the uh, shorter screws, even that we reach angulations in the rabbit tibia of 55 degrees. So I, I, I think it doesn't make really an, an, an effect unless either it's an overload or uh, it's a, a, a special thing that changes the morphology. Like in Blount disease, where probably the uh, physis itself is unstable. So, so you don't think it's yetogrenic? Yeah. It's it's not it's not the surgeon's failure. It's 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 my maybe more biological. Well, I think it's up to a certain point. It's biological, but what I'm trying to say it's experimental. We were unable to find any difference between short and long screws. Okay. Okay. You know, if you I think the there is other factors it. that's probably missing. I, I don't know which ones, but we're missing certainly something. So the big question is initial. Yeah, please, Sorry? Yeah, please, please. Okay. So in Blount's disease, if you, um, if you do leave a gap between the metamphysis and the plate, then you don't have a tension band. The screw heads cannot diverge because that screw is captured, you know, in the three point yeah. bending effect. Mm. So. Yeah. Let's go to the next case, please. Okay. Just uh, uh, the, the only thing anecdotal that's, uh, a, a, it's quite interesting. It's uh, a case of a failure of the plate. Uh, that's the only one reported that comes from the group of Kenneth Noonan. And they suggested that overweight in children, uh, that children, especially in blondes, they have a cyclical stress over the um, area. Uh, they, they work by cyclical stress on the physis, and that may produce fatigue of the material. Well, but anyway, let's go to the next case. Go to the last one just briefly. I have a comment. That plate is the peanut plate from Biomat that Ken Noonan yeah. designed. And so the eight plates are stronger and don't break. And uh, he didn't point that out in the article, but that's a peanut plate. Yeah, no, definitely, yeah. Uh, he, he, he pointed that it's a peanut, but he didn't say anything about resistance. Right. Thank you for the, for, for the tip. Okay, I'm going to the second case. That's a clinical, uh, that's a, a girl aged seven uh, years, six months, has a near dysplasia and severe genital valgum. Uh, it's not my passion, it's a passion of a friend of mine that's led at me for this presentation. And they decided uh, uh, in front of this severe genital valgo to uh, start uh, with uh, guided growth. Please, comments from the audience. I would have placed a plate in the left proximal yes. tibia based on the anatomic angle. There's slightly more valgus on the left. and in displays and at your discretion, you may want to do two levels to expedite a very slow recovery. But other than that, and again, I would have used longer screws, but I agree with the attempt. Any please, other comments? What do you think about this? Yeah, well, yeah. I, I think- Manoj, just, please. Yeah, I think just the same. I think the screws, the screws are too short. I would use longer Longer screws, this is point number one, and maybe maybe also at the tibia, but I don't have any experience in relation to when to put it into the proximal tibia. Can you tell me anything about how much genovalgum 
and then you say if it's uh, more than 30 degrees I will put in in the proximal tibia hour. Do you have any rules you use in your clinic in relation to put it also in such a case in the proximal tibia? So I envision the image, it used to be plain film, put it up so the knee is horizontal. And then you can see if there's valgus at femur and tibia, which there is on the left, it's, it's a shortcut to measuring the anatomic angle. So if you draw a line across the tibial uh, plateaus in one, and here you have a curve in this diaphysis, which points out the frailty of our measurements. But mm -hmm. if you average out the shank of the tibia to the top end, there is valgus for sure on the left and a little bit on the right. So I, although I rely on the mechanical axis, I do measure anatomic angles when in doubt, or I, I think about it as the knee being horizontal, which is the goal. So I am apt to do two levels. Um, the other thing I would have done is a taller plate. In the little kids, it's tempting to use the shorter plate, but that two places each screw closer to the physis so that if it does drag, you may, um, well, you end up with a metazole procedure. You end up with a screw across the physis, which doesn't mean it won't work. But if you do want to take out one screw and put one back in sometime, you don't have that opportunity. Can I say something? Yes, please. Okay, so, you know, I just wanted to illustrate that same point again. In skeletal dysplasia, the growth plate is not very well defined. And having a short plate is a disadvantage. So as Peter mentioned, choose a long plate and have uh, longer screws uh, going like that. Exactly. That, that would be a much better construct uh, than using shorter plate. So they are small, small children, they are dwarfs but they require longer plate. And if they're even smaller, you can do an arthrogram because a lot of the condyle may not be ossified and you can assure yourself you're not in the joint. Yeah, please, Bardi. Yeah, that, I think that that's a good point. I use arthrograms in those kids because as you say, you never know how the anatomical form is of these uh, condyles. So, so I put uh, I put contrast in the knee uh, to be sure that everything is as optimal. But I also have a problem in relation to these kids, uh, where to place the the plate in the lateral plane. Now this is a cor is a coronal or AP. Do you do do you do have any? I mean, can you give any good advice in relation to place it in the lateral plane? Sometimes I feel that it's a good idea to place a little bit in front uh, of the medial plane when you're looking at the lateral plane. Do you, I, I hope you understand what I'm saying. So I would, my normal placement is mid-sagittal or an idiopathic mid or posterior to it, but not anterior because you don't want weaker bottom. But the, the, mm -hmm. in contrary to that, if they have a knee flexion deformity, I agree, you go anterior to the midline because you can correct the knee oblique plane. Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting paper about that that shows that uh, you should go at the mid-level of the condyle, not the mid-shaft. Because uh, if you go on the mid-shaft, right. mid you may produce an angular deformity in the sagittal plane. And if there's clearly uh, think... an oblique plane deformity, you, you rotate the limb under fluoro to you see the apex, the, the maximal deformity, and that's where you put the plate. Yeah, I agree. But I, I think it's a very important point to say that don't go posterior. I mean, this, no, is, no. this, is, this is a lesson, lesson I have learned. Don't go posterior to the middle line. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to, I'm sure you all uh, got the, the point because you can see what's happened with the patient uh, when uh, he missed uh, <clears throat> during the lockdown. And he reappeared recently with this X-rays. Very, very well corrected, but I think the point is well taken about what has happened with the eight plates and the reason. It, it's surprising it corrected so much in that yes. diagnosis in that short a time. That's amazing. I agree. It's, it, I wouldn't expect that. This is crazy, really. I, what has happened really here? I don't know, <laughs> but it's amazing. Okay, so I wanted to raise the topic of uh, the sleeping, uh, the sliding plates. Okay, it's very few literature on the sliding plates, but I found uh, a recent report uh, from 
two years ago, where they reported uh, a group of six patients, all of them share in common that they were very young patients, less than 10 years of age. They had osteopenic conditions and they had shore screws, less than 40% of the physis. So <clears throat> having said that, I will walk into the next case. That's a girl aged nine uh, and three months, has a, a hemi hypertrophy and a leg leg discrepancy of four centimeters. Uh, also comes from the same friend of mine uh, in another big city in Spain. And uh, she decided to treat it with uh, mm, a temporary uh, epiphysiodesis. Uh, I, I would like to hear your comments about this case. So when I place plates for angular correction, the screws are more or less parallel. When I do it for length, they're diverging at the outset. It's no longer a tension band anyway. If you place them parallel, that's when you may get the intraarticular deformity that's on the question list, like the pagoda tibia. Uh, this may not happen, but you know, there's, and also there's a lag in the effect. If you place them parallel, as shown here, for several months, they'll grow and the screws may diverge. Not to say it won't work, but it will take more time. And here time is not of the essence, but a technical feature that I would uh, diverge the screws and do both levels. And then there's an empirical guideline that two years is the limit for restriction of length, not for angle, but for length. So respect, and that came from a, a personal communication between Femister and Blount and was never documented and never will be. So I respect it nevertheless. And so in a case like this, and I've done several, I put them in divergent, see them twice a year to rule out angular deformity. At the two year point, I take out the metaphyseal screws if the plates are still in good position, wait six months and then put them back in. And following those guidelines, I have no regrets. Any other yeah. comments? Yeah, please, Barney. Yeah, well, my experience is just the same that, that we have tried it and we have used this method, but, but we are a little bit reluctant to do it now, but, but it's true that we don't use it if the leg length discrepancy is greater than two centimeters. For us, two centimeters is the maximum. And, uh, and then of course we have to discuss with the parents two centimeters is that, is it worth it? Cause there's pain related to it maybe, but, but to us, it's two centimeters maximum. And I agree with you, Peter, that we put the screws so they are divergent. So this is how we do it. But to be honest, we are, we are not using it that much anymore, but, but we're now trying to do a, a follow-up on our patients. So, so maybe I can come back with good or bad uh, results. I'll see, I'll tell you. So I have a comment on that. I've, I've started as young as age three with, with hemihypertrophy and gigantism on the premise that uh, shoe lift isn't doing anything. They're gonna get long leg hip dysplasia problems. And uh, at some point you either have to lengthen the normal leg, which is absurd, or shorten the hemihypertrophic, hemihypertrophic leg, which may not heal well and have infection problems and so on. So given that grisly outcome, I've started as young as age three and interestingly, and tethered three or four times sequentially. In fact, I, I tether them when they reach two centimeters, not below for, for this, for hemihypertrophy. Mm -hmm. And on the premise that you, you prevent a shoe lift and you'll prevent bigger surgery later. And mm -hmm. interestingly, if you use the multiplier method, what was predicted to be a nine or 10 centimeter discrepancy in some kids, they come out equal in adolescence. So that you, if you slow down the exuberant physis more than once, it seems to take some wind out of its sails. So I strongly encourage people to consider doing that, considering the other options. Yeah, we, we also do, uh, we also using hemi hypertrophy and we try to do it early. Uh, but the interesting thing of this case is when the patient came for follow-up. And you can see here the x-rays. Mm -hmm. So what's curious is the lateral plates, I don't know if they had purchased in the beginning, but they're both not contributing anymore. And one would expect mm -hmm a various deformity if that were the case. So I, I'm not sure what, what's, I'm not sure what to say about that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was amazed. I mean, when I saw the case, when we discussed, I, I was amazed because it's only gone on the lateral side. So uh, 
never seen that in in a in an epiphysiolysis effect, having plates on both sides. One question: Why haven't the screws diverged? Uh, they they were parallel initially, so they have the diverged something. But I think it has, that's one of the reasons that it has to do, that they were parallel. And probably when they pull, they were pulled through. So I, 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 that's my guess, but, but it's quite amazing. Yes, I agree. Um, Ignacio, do we have a little view of the, the immediate post-op? Uh, yeah, we, we can go back to the pre-op. Uh, to, to the immediate post-op. I would agree that on the lateral side on the tibia, it may be on the birch, but on the lateral side in the femur, I would think that is a very acceptable position, although the screws may be a bit convergent. Can I ask a question? Uh, Please. Yeah. Please. Yeah. So, so in my experience, you know, when we use uh, Eight plate for hemi epiphysiotis. The range of movement comes very fast. But whenever I've used a medial and a lateral plate uh, in lower femur or uh, limb length equalization, uh, these are the children who take a very long time to get uh, range of movement and their knee is painful for a long time. So, you know, can someone throw, uh, you know, some, uh, you know, light on that? And secondly, why not use screws? Why not use pet screws? Uh, cross or parallel to each other, uh, you know, for uh, because we are not using a tension bend principle here. You know, it's a complete control of the growth. So why not use, uh, you know, either a, 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 a screws or uh, why not use uh, say uh, uh, plates which have uh, uh, which are locked plates, short lock plates. Mm. I don't think that uh, plates would produce any difference here. We'd probably have the same x-ray post-op. Yeah. Uh, I think we, we, we don't like the concept in, in young children of crossing the, uh, the, the vices with a screw. So uh, I agree that this is not uh, a, a tension by an outside, but you remain extra facile thing that you cannot it, it makes me a bit unhappy to use in a very young child uh, a screw going through and expecting then later growth. I know PETS is reversible, but mm, it doesn't have any advantage of a, uh, at least the studies doesn't show any big difference between the eight plates and PETS in the number of angular deformities or in the number of uh, Mm, growth uh, um, in rest. Well, PETS is purportedly reversible, but almost all of the articles are adolescents. So I'm not convinced that it is in younger kids. I wouldn't trust it either. Now, the question is, I don't know how old she is in the follow-up, but you may take them out and just drill the physes because you probably won't overcorrect. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's carry on. It just was a curiosity. So now it's it's a, a simple case, no, no, nothing secret. It's a girl, age nine and eight, nine years and eight months, uh, who has a genovalgum deformity, and that's the same girl at the age of ten uh, plus seven that uh, has increased slightly. And my question here goes: When you see an angular deformity. I would like to know the panel when they will decide to do the uh, angular correction and whether they wait till they get close to maturity or they will do it as soon as they see it. Please, if you want to answer. Yes, Manoj, what is your opinion? So in terms of, uh, if, if there is, uh, um, um, if the axis deviation is to, if it is zone two and beyond, that is, you know, the, I would definitely kind of uh, offer them uh, growth modulation. Um, if it is a young child in zone one, and if there are uh, underlying metabolic uh, workup which needs to be optimized, then I would wait and watch. But anything in zone two and above, I would offer correction. Um, 
that's my view on that. And in, at this particular age, there is really not much to be gained by waiting. Style is already 10 plus 7, 10 and a half. And so, and I can see both the axes in zone 2. So I would offer correction straight away. But you have offer at the age of 9 uh, plus 8 that was already in zone 2? Yeah, at, at 9 plus 8, even with that degree of deviation, yes. Um, uh, and uh, again, in an Indian context, we find that um, we, we have difficulty getting any amount of uh, correction beyond the age of uh, 11 uh, in girls, especially. So 9 plus 8, you know, so that's something with zone 2 deviation I would definitely offer, even at presentation. Yes, Saral, what do you think? Uh, before we go to the Marne, Saral, what do you think about this? Will you operate at this age or will you wait for another a year or so? So, dictum in India is, you know, if uh, any child presents after nine years with such deformity, uh, you know, you should offer growth modulation and correct. Because the next time you may see the child is at age of 13, by, and by that time, osteotomy will be the only answer. So, you know, it's, it's important that you educate the parents and, uh, you know, do uh, assessment of the growth for the child. Because uh, many girls uh, at age of nine plus eight, uh, if you take an elbow x-ray, the, the olecranon may be stage three. Uh, you know, it may not, and, and, and it may be appropriate. Very rarely it has occurred that uh, you operate a very young child, you get correction with growth modulation. You remove the screws and after a year, you see recurrence of genu valgum. And when that recurs, unfortunately, the child uh, is at a stage where growth modulation is no longer possible. So I don't do it less than nine years age, but I, after nine years, keep a close watch. And uh, as soon as I get olecranon on stage three, I would offer growth modulation. So my decision yes, is... Yes, uh, Marne first and then Peter. Yeah, Peter, let's say opinion of Marne first and then, then your final word. Yeah, please, Marne. Well, my, my question is here, that was there any symptoms? Because we see a lot of, of, of uh, especially girls having skin of algum and... Uh, and they're coming because of anything. I mean, there could be pain in the proximal femur. Or, and then we see it of a physical examination. We see this intermalleolar distance of nine centimeters plus. And we ask them, do you have pain in your knees? And they say, no, we don't have pain in our knees. But, but we often see this at nine years and uh, when they just have started school and be active, maybe in football and so on, but they don't have any pain. So my question is actually that uh, those who have pain, it's great to, to treat them nine years plus, but, but, but how if you see, if you find this configuration and the child do not have any symptoms, uh, do you then, is it, is it mandatory to, to tell the parents that, wow, we have to do something about this skin of Elm because of these nine centimeters plus intermalleolar. And, and I would like you to, to tell me, what do you do in, in certain instance where you don't have any symptoms from the knees? So if I saw her at nine plus eight and she had no pain, I would suggest that the parents, I show them what I measure. I measure the intermalleolar distance prone on the table and I measure, and my fingers are three centimeters wide. So I show the parents how I measure it. Mm -hmm. I also tell them, you have a smartphone, you can send a picture if you're worried or in three or six months or whatever, you don't have to come to Salt Lake City for me to do this. This is what I do, this is simple, but if they're developing pain, and of course they'll all have circumduction gait, which may beget patellar issues and other problems. So if they're evolving symptoms, come back and this is what I'll do. Um, I'd like to see them in a year either way, unless their legs get straighter, then that's fine. And uh, you know, if the other thing is I don't base it all on the x-ray because you may have somebody with significant circumduction gait and then the x-ray tech has them stand at attention on their best behavior and the mechanical axis looks better than you expect. Well, the x-ray simply tells me they have equal limb lengths, physis are open, and it may corroborate or, or may not support how much valgus I'm seeing, but I let the clinical picture determine if and when I do it. I don't think any have, have reached maturity based on my lack of enthusiasm for this, but I don't talk them into it. I tell them it's not time sensitive, but I need at least a year to grow for it to work. Okay, I, I just want yeah, to please. make two, two small points on relation of what has been said. 
Uh, we certainly treat different populations. I mean, uh, our patients, girls normally menstruate in uh, around the age of 12. So at age 10, there's still quite a lot of growth to go. And the second thing that is more important is we don't need to make our parents aware of the deformity because the main consultation is because they are too much aware of the deformity. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we get difficulties to know whether they really have symptoms or uh, they really are concerned about the aesthetical deformity, the cosmetical deformity. And it's not unusual to find patients that they are symptomless and you say, well, you are symptomless, I wouldn't do anything. And when they, you offer them follow-up, they come saying, we have symptoms. So you never know whether the family wants it to correct or it really they have symptoms. Okay, having made this small yeah. point. Yeah, but just before that, uh, well, I want to say something. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think, Ignacio, I totally agree with you, but I think it's very important now to underline that it's very to, important to have this kind of x-ray. A full range, I mean, you have the hips, the knee, and the ankle joint. And this is, for me, very important to have in relation to follow the kids. Sometimes I see colleagues taking only a part of the, you know, they're taking the knee and nothing else. So we don't have the hip and you don't have the ankle. So to me, it's very important to tell my colleagues that please take a full length of the, uh, uh, of the, uh, of the bones. And, and so we can see this mechanical axis and the anatomical axis. And then, and, and, but, but do you, do you, do you ask for that to uh, have this long standing x-rays? Yeah, always. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so we eventually, the patient came back a year later complaining of some uh, <coughs> discomfort on the knee. He has a circumvention gait. The parents in the, uh, uh, were very concerned, so we decided to do the correct the um, surgery. We achieved full correction at the age of 11 and 6. And... Uh, we remove the plates at full correction. So the question is, when do you remove the device and how do you do to try to prevent rebound? Do you let overgrowth a bit uh, or uh, you try to hold on as late as you can? I just want to know the opinion of the panelists. So is it the right time to remove the plate or would you like to go for slightly more over correction and then you will remove the plate? Yeah, so let's have opinion of uh, Taral first, then Manoj and then Barney and then Peter. Yeah, Taral, please. Yeah, yeah. so I go by the lines and uh, you know when I reach station zero, I will remove the plate. I don't uh, okay. wait for over correction. Uh, okay. you know, just when the leg is straight, I would remove the plate. Okay, Manoj, what do you think? Like, is it the right time to remove the plate when it is at uh, uh, like I the complete go, correction? I go for a slight bit of overcorrection, especially in the younger children below ten. I would want a, definitely a little bit of overcorrection because the uh, chances of rebound are much higher. Um, I would go for a slight bit of overcorrection. Okay, Manoj, what do you think? Yeah, uh, we we are we. Are, I want to measure the mechanical axis as you have mentioned. And then we'll have a slightly, slightly over that, so a slightly kind of varum. We, so we, but we want to be sure that we have a full correction in relation to the mechanical axis, but we would like to have plus one in this area. Okay. Yes, Peter. So early in my practice, I'd let them go into medial zone one and then take the plate out. And thinking that, well, in adolescence, you're not gonna get rebound, but in fact, we can't predict or prevent rebound. So for several years now, uh, if they have at least a year to grow, and if the knees and ankles are touching simultaneously, and the x-ray is supportive, and the plates are in good position, I percutaneously remove the metaphyseal screw. I have them send me a picture once a month, explain, you know, if they're drifting back into valgus, return, and we'll put the screw back in. And I can't give you the percentages of that, but it's, it's not 50%, but it's significant. It's probably close to it. If they reach maturity without rebound and with a single plate and screw and don't have symptoms, then there's no need to remove the plate. 
So I, I do the single screw removal with or without reinsertion on a routine basis. Uh, yeah, but that is when there is a slight overcorrection. Yeah, okay. neutral to slight. Like, like if they come back, what they do now is send me a picture. And if it looks perfect on the picture, I'll uh, have them come in to schedule removal of screw or plate, depending on the x-ray I take the day they come. So they don't even come to clinic. They come, have an x-ray, come down to surgery, and then we discuss which is, will best serve that child. And if they're near maturity, I may get a bone age and convince myself, okay, I'll take the whole plate out. But I rarely have to put a plate back in. In fact, I don't have to anymore. The, the parent's enthusiasm to go through the first procedure is very limited. It's always more painful than you tell them it'll, than they think you told them it would be. Um, but there, the threshold to remove a screw and reinsert a screw is like nothing. You know, it takes 10 minutes. There's no, they need an anesthetic and it's not cheap, of course, but they need no um, pain control, no activity restriction, one single stitch. And so they're much more on board with monitoring their own kids, sending pictures and deciding, you know, with me whether to repeat the process. And I have some kids who are, you know, girls who are 16 and still growing, or boys who are 18 and still growing. So you, there's no such thing as perfect timing. There just isn't. Yeah. The other thing about overcorrecting, uh, I think it's uh, quite a few bi biomechanical studies that shows that one degree of virus mechanically is equivalent uh, to three degrees of bulgus. So if you don't get rebound and you leave the patient in various, probably biomechanically, you haven't reached anything but just correcting the valgus. And I think that's an important thing to keep in mind when you decide to overcorrect, because if it's not going to be rebound, you're going to live probably mechanically in the same situation that he was before starting. Okay, so let's go to review literally. See, yeah, yeah, please. A couple of questions to um, Peter. Um, one is with regard to the removing the metaphyseal screw. Do you just remove the screw? Do you do anything as an adjunct? Do you put some bone wax? Do you lift them off the uh, surface of the no. bone? No, just remove the screw. So here is one of the benefits of cannulation. I make a two millimeter incision, stick the guide pin in there and take the screw out, period. I don't put anything in there. I don't expose anything. And it, you have to make sure which is usually the case that the epiphyseal screw and the plate are still in good position because if if they're if either one is compromising the physis then take the whole thing out you know you, there are some people who worry about continued tethering and various overcorrection if you only take out one screw yes i have cases i could show you i think i sent one to uh, Dyron. i see that a couple times a year but compared to the scores of kids who don't have that so anyway i don't put anything in there i just take the screw out and on, on a plain AP view, because of the trapezoidal shape of the distal femur, you may misjudge and think, oh, there's bone over that plate. But under fluoro, you can, you can get a tangential view and assure yourself that's a, a radiographic artifact. Yeah, okay. Uh, I'm just going to review what we know about Raban. We, we, we discussed the, the last day about the sleeping plates. So just... If we look at the literature, uh, what we found about Raban is a paper published in 2018, where it looked uh, only to idiopathic genovalgum and varus, and they found that Raban it's common if you measure in millimeters, and there is a strong correlation between the uh, incidence of Raban and <clears throat> the um, age of a skeletal maturity uh, of plate removal and the body ma uh, mass index. And it's also a less strong correlation with age of implantation. The group of Texas also did a review about rebound and they found that uh, as much as 52, uh, they, they included a group of varied etiology that included congenital, idiopathic, and uh, all kind of uh, etiologies. They found that rebound was quite common if we consider more than five degrees. It, it happens up to 52% of, of their group. And if you consider rebound of more than 10 degrees, it happened in 30% of their patients. Uh, age was an important factor at the moment of implantation and 
if they were boys below the age of 12 or girls below the age of 10, there were a higher chance of uh, relapse. And also <clears throat> the amount of the initial deformity. If the initial deformity was over 20 degrees, the chances of uh, rebound were as high as 78%. But they concluded that uh, rebound it's unpredictable, and they suggested that we shouldn't overcorrect systematically. There's also a work uh, published about uh, <clears throat> stapling, who they found that the chances of rebound were related to the faster uh, that the um, angulation happened. When faster was the angulation corrected, the bigger were the chances of rebound. And funny enough, they found the contrary of the first group, that body mass index had a protective factor. So what it makes you query whether uh, it has any factor. So the interesting thing to us was to ask ourselves what's happened to the physis when you remove the device. We know what's happened when you put the device, but barely hardly anything has been written about what's happened. So we did an experimental work uh, using rabbits of age six uh, weeks, and we did a medial tibial ME epiphysiodesis, and we removed the plate at three weeks, and then sacrificed the rabbits at different intervals after removal, between three days and three weeks. So what we looked, when we did the histology, we saw that it was fairly a constant relationship between the height of the lateral, central, and medial area. And always the lateral side of the physis was slightly narrow than the uh, medial and central area. When we did the study on the rabbits where we removed the uh, plate, we th saw that by three days after removal, it was a large increase of the height of the growth plate. And by one week, this, incre this uh, increase in height was even bigger. When we went back to two weeks, the increase started to go down. And by three weeks, it had fully normalized. So the other thing that we saw is that when you look at three days, there is a disorganization of the columnar structure at the level of the hypertrophic cells. But what is more interesting, it's these spaces that appear in the middle of the physis, that they are empty spaces and remind what it has been described in the uh, physiolysis when we do destruction of the physis. When we look at three days, these empty spaces are full with fibrin and there is no cells. And by one week, what we can see, it's the invasion by undifferentiated mesenchymal cells. By two weeks, these cells has fully transformed to chondrocytes and the columnar structure has been recovered. And by three weeks, it's impossible, even by microscopy or by naked eye, to see any difference between the normal physis and the physis that has been submitted to uh, the uh, growth uh, control. So we reckon that it has to do with the viscoelastic properties of the physis that when it's submitted to compression, when suddenly it's released, it produces a destruction of the physis and produce a rupture inside the physis. The other interesting finding was that rebound never happened immediately after removal of the plate. So there was no rabbit on the period between uh, the, that they were sacrificed at three days, one week or two weeks that had rebound. And we only saw rebound on those that were operated more than uh, that they were operated three weeks before. And it didn't happen in all the cases. It happened mainly in the cases that had bigger angulation. 
And when we look that on the histology, what we saw is that the ones that had rebound had more intense, more intense changes in the physis, but they subsided earlier than in the average group. So the conclusion is that the rebound is highly variable in incidence and intensity, and when present, does not occur immediately. So, and now I will handle to Taral to present uh, the next case. Okay. Please, Taral, can, can you... Yeah, can uh, you show the next slide, please? Yeah, yeah sure. So, this is an 11-year-old child with a facial injury. This child had a cricket ball injury on the medial side of the knee, had some hematoma, was treated with ice and compression, and then everything became all right. Uh, when the parents noticed a progressive virus deformity after six months. So show the next textbook. Next slide. So this is, uh, you know, sort of uh, the presentation of the child. He presented uh, with the uh, virus. And when we did MRI, uh, you know, this was lateral growth plate arrest. You know, probably this is something like a uh, rung uh, type 6 uh, starter eris injury, rung uh, where there is injury to perichondrium. Uh, you know, the, the dilemma, you know, for me is that is growth plate or growth modulation useful in these patients? If we use it along with the excision of the bar, is it going to work for this child? And second dilemma which I have is uh, what about the facial, what about the articular slope? So if you see the articular slope uh, on the X-ray, you know, this child also has a tented physis, a tented articular, tented proximal tibia. And, uh, you know, after doing a facial bar excision and growth modulation, will this correct or this will require an additional surgery? So I want uh, views from the expert. Yeah, so let's start with uh, Barney. What do you think? Uh, will you go for the facial bar resection alone or will you add on the growth modulation on the medial side sorry uh, the little side yeah of course i i, I would take um I, i'll try i'll try really to try to take away this bone bridge and and looking at the age of 11 i will put um i'll, I'll put the eight plate uh, on on the opposite side and uh, to be sure that i don't miss anything in relation to the age it's 11 years old so so I would take away the bone bridge and then put in eight plates on, on the lateral side. Hey Manoj, what will you do? The same thing or something different? You are mute. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I agree. I, 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 it would be a resection of the bar and, uh, and an eight plate on the lateral side. Mm, and I wouldn't be too concerned about the joint as such because I don't see a significant amount of depression. So I think this should do well with the resection and the knee plate on the lateral side. Yes, Peter, what will you do? The same thing or you will tackle it differently? No, I would do the same thing. I agree that the medial tibial slope is mild and you might have to overcorrect a little to get a neutral axis, but in and of itself, unless it progressed, it doesn't require attention. There are two things that come to mind, um, two reasons to augment the physial bar resection with guided growth on the contralateral side. One is that in a study in rabbits, as I recall, up to 6% physial bar may spontaneously lyse in, with continued growth, meaning that the physis is way more powerful, as uh, Ignacio just showed us, than we give it credit for. The second thing is Ken Noonan did a study in sheep with staples where when he stapled the one side of the tibia, not only did it inhibit that side, but it accelerated the other side. So I see the physis as a global village and the, the tibial, the, the eight plate is a, a zoning law. Like you can't grow here, but you can grow on the other side. It's conceptual, unproven, but I totally agree with that initial approach. And Ignacio, will you do the same thing? The physial bar resection and the modulation on the other side? Well, to me, it, it, it's a bit, contradictory because we know when you do a physical re resection that you can get a rebound growth. And to me, conceptually, it's difficult to understand 
why you're doing at the same time a resection that you want to give full power to your physis and you constrain your physis on the other side. And that's, to me, has been a contradictory con concept that it's difficult to understand. Right. So I when you do like a stage procedure, means like you will remove the bar and then after a few months, you will go for the growth modulation? Correct. Yeah, I, I would like my physis to be as free, as powerful as it can at this stage. And then I still have plenty of time to correct the deformity uh, by guided growth. So my approach would be to do the resection of the bar and then see how much is the uh, physis able to do. If I get some rebound growth by removing the, the plate and then if it's not enough, I will do my guided growth. Okay, let's start. What did you do? Next slide. Oops, sorry. Okay, that was. Should I carry on, Taral? Should next slide? I just have one comment. I, I, I respect Ignacio's conservative approach, but. I think the enthusiasm for physial bar resection has been tempered by the fact that although angular correction can occur, it's unpredictable and often may not. So why not improve your odds while they're under anesthesia? And because it's a temporary restraint and a tension band and extra periosteal, I see it as redirecting physial energy toward the medial side to accelerate the correction. Okay. Yes, sir, please take over. Okay, should I carry next slide? Taran, you are mute. He's muted. Oh, next slide, please. Yeah, next slide. Okay, there we are. So this is what we did. I uh, I did a uh, excision of the bar, and we put a cement spacer. You can see the spacer here, and these are the two markers uh, which we have put. And then I did guided growth from the lateral side. And next slide, please. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Please. Go ahead. Yeah. So this is after three months. You know, you see that screws are being divergent, uh, but varus is still there. Go ahead. And this is after eight months. Uh, you know, we saw that the deformity fully corrected. Screws are divergent, and the cement spacer also has moved. But what caught my attention uh, when we removed the screw was something else. Yeah. Next slide, please. So if you see this Siam picture. Uh, you know, when the screws were removed, what, what appears that uh, the TBL plateau is absolutely straight. So not only the deformity was corrected, uh, 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 but also the articular slope also got corrected. So now this is something uh, I did not anticipate. Uh, I really did not know how would, how would it occur. And I want uh, opinions and some, you know, concepts from uh, the experts as to why this would occur. So again, philosophically, uh, Huter Volkman described their effect in round bones and tarsal bones, but if effectively the epiphysis is a round ball, bone on the end of a stick. And it's growing on two fronts, articular and physeal. So I think the articular depression was secondary to Huter Volkman compression, mechanical axis displacement. And that's why uh, you see this rebound effect that as you re restore the mechanical axis, you the plateau can heal. And the, the x-ray previous that showed the angle of the proximal tibia to the top end was probably a bit pessimistic because you can't see the unossified part of the plateau that's not quite as depressed. The, my question, uh, Peter, is that the surgery was done on the physis. Physis contributes to the bone on metaphysial side. Yes, Not but I that. think the articular growth was a, spon was a secondary by serendipity, if you will, that correcting the mechanical axis allowed, removed the pressure on the medial plateau and allowed ossification of bone and some growth there. Also for the limb length inequality, perhaps you addressed it, but you may either want to inhibit the other tibia or if there isn't much time, uh, pangenu or whatever, but to address his length discrepancy. So the child did not have a significant limb length. Yeah, next one. 
next slide okay so there is no significant limb length discrepancy only just few millimeters so we did not uh, all right there yeah. any next any slide. other observations on this case uh, well it's a lovely case i i reveal the literature uh sorry do you want to mention anything else no that's it that's, that's all okay it's uh a recent publication from uh javier mas uh masquijo from chile who showed that uh they did a similar procedure in five patients in the distal femur four were uh in valgus one was in veris and the average size of the physical rest was 17%. They achieved restoration of growth in all valgus cases and fail on the various case that all of them were central one, except the, uh, and they were quite well defined, except the one that had some indentations in the physis and was irregular. Two patients had rebound and one required reimplantation of guided growth. And the patient that fell was due to the regular bone uh, bar and was also the older patient. Even more surprising is a paper coming from China uh, where they used a system in 45 patients with, uh, for sequela or fracture of the uh, distal tibia that were uh, that resulted in a various deformity. The median edge uh, when they did the resection was H9, and the median various deformity was 20 degrees preoperative, and they finished with a five degrees postoperative. They decreased the angulation in more than 10 degrees in 31 patients, and they couldn't find differences in edge, gender. Uh, between the group that went well and the 31 patients and the group that didn't do well, the 14 patients. So it's, a, it, it's an interesting topic and I'm sure it will come more literature in the next coming years. So, so I'm just going to go to, to another topic and I want to know the opinion of the panel, how important is the device that you use? Any, is there any reason why we should use one or other device? Yes, so let's start with Tunnel. What is your, uh, Peter, last, uh, you will be the last one to, okay. because we know your answer. So Tunnel, what is your choice of implant? Yeah. So we use an implant, uh, which, are, which have been designed by Peter Stevens. They are manufactured in India. Uh, they are titanium implants similar to the eight plates. Uh, the reason I use them is, one is they are cannulated. Uh, and it's ease of insertion. I can do it through a smaller incision. Uh, and uh, the, the, the uh, removal as well as uh, the, the insertion and removal, both are easier with this. Okay. Yes. Uh, Manoj, what is your preference? Uh, I, I've always used only the eight plate, so I can't comment on the others. I don't see any reason to kind of... Uh, uh, use anything different. So just for the same reasons which uh, Tharal mentioned, it's 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 worked fine for me. I've not had to change it. Okay. And uh, what about Barney? What do you, what is your preference for this um, choice of implant? You are you need to unmute yourself, Barney. Uh, we use the original ones, Peter Stevens eight place and. Um, and maybe it doesn't make any difference. I'm not sure, but um, but as you see, when when uh, science and research tell us that uh, they are the best, we don't change. But but maybe because of uh, of the expenses on the on the plates, maybe we can use this recon plate and uh, and so on. But I I don't have any experience in relation to others. But 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 maybe it doesn't have this great impact of which one we use, but maybe Peter can tell us. Yeah, before that, uh, Sandeep, what is your, because you are always cost concern and like uh, for the India, the cost is one of the important point. So what is your choice of implant? Right now, sir, we are restricted by what is available. 
Okay. Now we have two companies which are making uh, the, the what Dr. Peter Stevens has guided them to make. Uh, but what I feel is that the titanium, in addition to the cost, I have found in a few cases evokes a lot of bone formation, especially in renal osteodystrophy with deformities. When I removed the plates, in spite of plate removal, there was a bone bridge across. And it continued to work like a growth modulation till I actually cut that bone bridge. So I would be happier if we can get it in stainless steel and solid screws, especially for heavier patients. So if you have both varieties, it would be good. And unfortunately, some of the cheaper implants by some companies, they weld the screw onto the head. And again, because these are cancellous screws in a growing child, Removal is mandatory and I have found when you turn the torque, the screwdriver, the head breaks at the neck. So I would prefer a single piece implant, which is with large threads for ease of removal. And I, I hope we can get stainless steel ones because uh, there is too much bone reaction and bone growth around the titanium screws. For that, we have a reconstruction plate. So, uh, yeah, but the recon so... plate is not as yielding. The plate needs to be contoured and elastic enough because it needs to spread out. The stainless steel plate, recon plate, is too stiff. Okay, right. Yeah. So, Peter, what is your <laughs> opinion on this? And what about the comments of Sandeep? <clears throat> How much time do we have? <laughs> Uh, yeah, we are like uh, last two or three minutes. Last oh, two or three minutes. Back before the pandemic, when I used to travel, I, I assembled a keychain with at least three dozen implants from around the world. And <laughs> yes, they, they all work. They all work, okay? I apologize for the expense of the titanium. I have no control over that. That's a Western corporate issue, by the way. And, and so starting uh, with the hinge plate that's over-engineered and unnecessary and no proven advantage. I think it's not cannulated screws, which are harder to remove. I have no, I never will have experience with it, but you know, and, and you'd have to conceptually have the hinge exactly at the right location. Um, the peanut plates are, and they have kinks in them and that's why that plate broke. They're, they're too thin and over-engineered and not helpful. The recon plate, I used semi-tubular first uh, one third semi-tubular and back in 2003 and uh, it worked fine. However, the screw heads are more prominent and because of the curve in the one third tubular, the plate's too rigid. So I'd flatten them in a vise in order to make it more flexible, but then it changes the shape of the screw hole so that the, the screw could pass through the hole, which it did on a case of cubitus varus. So, you know, if you're on a desert island and, and you have a trauma set, you can use one third tubular or you can use recon. The recon's too rigid too, but borrowing from the recon idea, I narrowed the waist of the eight plate so that it will reverse bend and it reverse bends very nicely. And it, it, is, it is easier to contour and more flexible. Um, my objection to stainless steel is it's not MRI compatible. It's not superior, but it's also not MRI compatible. So um, that's a problem for some of these kids who may need MRIs at some point, especially if you're looking at the physis. So stainless steel does not confer any advantage in my opinion. And I have not had the experience of bone bridges. I put in, you know, thousands of eight plates and I may have had a bone bridge or two, but I think if I put in the same number of stainless, I would have the same effect. So in short, anything works. Remember <clears throat> ease of removal, not just ease of insertion. And the ones that are made by Uma Surgical in Mumbai, the eight plates, are undercut at the top and bottom end. So the screws can diverge twice as far as you see here, which adds more flexibility, which I think is a good, well, since I designed it, I think it's a good feature, but um, anyway. So yes. of them all, I think the titanium eight plate or equivalent is um, certainly my choice. Yes, over to you, Ignacio. What is the literature on this uh, question? Okay, well, uh, as we say, uh, there is some comparisons. There, there's a work from the special surgery who proved three models, uh, choice uh, in a biased way by the different surgeons. I couldn't find any difference between one and the others in the effects. And then there is two papers where compare uh, the recon plates uh, versus uh, 
the eight plates, and they all find that what it works is the concept uh, more than the plate. They, it's more bulky, and uh, that's I think it's in common between the work uh, that's come from Korea and the work from India, where both show that they got the same kind of correction by using a reconstruction plate than you can expect from a, an, an A plate. And I think that's the important thing. It's the principle still the same, although the plate is not uh, as flexible as could be the other. And that's all what I have to say. I think it's all proof that it's just a question of the principle and not the question of a plate, although the plate may add some small benefit. One more comment, concerned about cost yeah. issues in other countries. We made plates out of ultra high molecular weight polyethylene and uh, tried them in sheeps and uh, the holes that stretched between the holes. So the idea of a flexible cost-effective implant, um, plastic did not work. Yeah, it's, it's a working uh, from uh, South America where they use a fire, uh, uh, fire bend, uh, two screws and just united by uh, a Tychron type of uh, bun and it worked very well. I mean, the results are excellent, I have to say. The key points are flexible and low profile. Anything can work if it has those features. That's, I think that's what all we proved. That's and, and it, the the, yeah. Okay, so I think now it's the time for the Sandeep to take over for the uh, summary and the vote of thanks. Over to you, Sandeep. Thank you, sir. So at, at the outset, at this conclusion, let me first thank Ignacio for putting together a wonderful webinar for Posi as usual. The way he does, is, does it is so brilliant that he starts with a case and then backs it up with literature so that nobody has any doubt remaining in the mind. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. Ignacio for uh, your kind contribution. Peter Stevens, as usual, uh, you are the inventor of the eight plate and your little tidbits and tips and tricks always help us understand this biological concept in a more fluid manner. We are just learning to understand how this growth plate really behaves. Sometimes it works for us, sometimes it works against us. Sometimes we take off the plate and biology fools you and rebounds and we are trying to find ways to fool it back and mold it into behaving the way we want. So thank you, Yarne, for your brilliant comments again. And Taral, brilliant of you to contribute in spite of your injury. And Manoj, thanks for your inputs. So with all that, thank you very much for this uh, session on complications. Thank you, Diren Bhai, and good night, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Yeah. I have stopped the connection, the recording. Hello. Yes. Uh, so I think it went really well. Yeah. It was very interesting. And mm -hmm. there were no questions. There were no messages from anybody. Right. So uh, I think uh, the effect of either uh, the match is going on T20 <laughs> or, or then uh, fatigue. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. But I think too much, too many webinar fatigue is another phenomena which we have seen during the COVID yes. period. Yes. But I think it's it's great that you're doing this. Uh, I mean, it's it's great, really, and I'm sure that many of our young colleagues have learned a lot from it. And uh, especially that there's this diversion. We don't have the same experience, but still, there is a common way to go. But I agree with you, Sandeep, that guided growth that's not that easy. I agree with you. Yeah. So yeah. there's a lot to learn. But I want to thank you and thank you for letting me in. Thank you. And, and, and I hope to see you in the future in real life. Okay. Absolutely. So thank we you. also yes. want the same thing. Thank you. Yeah, thank, yeah. You. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Yeah, good night. Right. Yes, Terrell, it was really nice to see you.